Welcome into a Monday edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young with you from K-State Online as we get set and ready to go for another week in Wildcat football. And it's going to get started on a a much more somber note than the first couple weeks of the season as the Cats now have their first loss of the year, the 30-27 loss to Missouri. So we'll give our final thoughts on that one, and uh, it'll be the last that you have to hear about the loss to Missouri uh, this season in all likelihood because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter uh, for what K-State's goal still ultimately is, but it does matter in the realm of being a team like TCU, for example, who had everything go right for them last year and showed what everything going right for you can do that gets you into the college football playoff. Now, I don't think any of us thought that K-State was a college football playoff team this year. I think everybody thought that this was a team that could go defend their title in Arlington. That, for the time being, is still a possibility and in front of them. But it is one of those things that you have to kind of take into consideration of. I mean, TCU had some, some close calls last year at various points. And something like a team hitting a 61-yard field goal on them did not happen last year. Uh, they were able to, to kind of do the flip of that. You think about how they won games against like Baylor or Texas where they, you know, basically a defensive struggle and kind of pulled it out at the end with a, a fumble recovery. A lot of different things there. So it's really the only way that the Missouri loss matters other than the fact that it hurts, it kills momentum, and uh, it's just not fun for the fans to deal with, to, to lose to a team like Missouri Uh for a lot of different reasons. So we will uh, dive into all of that uh, on this edition of the show. Yeah, I I think what is painful is the opponent, um, with it being a regional rivalry coached by Eli Drinkwitz. Yeah. The manner in which it happened, because Kansas State had numerous opportunities to pull away and win that game and didn't capitalize on that. And just losing it on a 61-yard field goal in general, I think is kind of painful, uh, more so for the players and coaches, of course. But um, if you're looking at it from like a media or a fan perspective, I think those are things to take into consideration. As you said, unless you were, you know, just hanging on the edge of your seat thinking that Kansas State was absolutely a playoff contender this year, and perhaps if they were undefeated in the non-con, that was a discussion maybe to have at some point then the end result is not directly impactful to what you expect from Kansas State this season. But maybe there are signs in within the game that could you know, either have you reassured for the rest of the season because there were still some bright spots or in some cases pretty concerned that those issues are not just a one-off but a reoccurring symptom. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. And, uh, hey, you know, the the drive back for, from Columbia was a lot less fun with a loss attached to it uh, for me than, than if it had been a win. Because, I, I, you know, I tell people, look, even if I hadn't gone to K-State, it's a lot more fun to cover wins and teams that win as opposed yeah. to losses. Um, I mean, I and I say that as a guy that up front experienced it last year working with uh, a guy that is now one of my my better friends, and Alec Bussey, who is an Illinois grad and has not had much to celebrate on the football field and is now covering Iowa State, who absolutely does not have a lot to celebrate on the football field right now. It's a lot more fun when anybody you're around wins, and K-State obviously came up just short. And I, The two things that are most frustrating about it from my perspective, uh, D.Y., are you, you said the first one uh, very clearly. Uh, I was trying to not – immediately get into it but yes losing to Elijah Drinkwitz is a pain in the butt for anybody that's one hard pill to swallow especially when and I said this on the Sunday show I think both coaching staffs deserve to lose that game neither coaching staff won that game on Saturday um Drinkwitz with you know his just bad management of the 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 delay of game that happened before the field goal that was kicked and some other just kind of silly moves and his lack of awareness. And then, you know, like the K-State staff, they they had a lot of things that could be questioned. Their aggressiveness, was it smart to give the defense uh, the the game in their hands again? And then also the fact that, you know, if Mevis misses that kick from 61, Mizzou's kicking it again because K-State had two number eights on the field. So that is also on the, the coaching staff. So neither staff deserved to win it. The players decided it. And uh, on Saturday, Missouri just had more better players or at least players that were in position to make plays and help them win the game. So we'll uh, 
Well, well, let's just dive into it right now. Let's let's get the final thoughts on the the loss of Missouri for K State. We'll get into our over unders from the game and everything else that took place. Um, but just real quick, Dy, what's the the overarching final take from the loss for K State and kind of how they have to move forward uh, after it? It's like this. I thought the special teams were solid, but there were times where it wasn't spectacular, namely a couple of shank punts there by Jack Bloomer. Ultimately didn't decide the game, I don't believe. Offense, really good start. They, that's what kept Kansas State in the game. But then when they needed to play the most, they weren't there um, when called upon. Defense, rough start. You could tell Missouri had been prepping for this game for months and months and months and had some things in the – coffer that Kansas State probably wasn't anticipating or hadn't seen yet. So you could tell that this was the Mizzou Super Bowl, which is what we imagined. And I think that presented itself on the offensive end for the Tigers early in the game and had the Kansas State defense on their heels. They ultimately adjusted and played the kind of defensive football that we expect from K-State, but maybe a little too late or they just gave up one too many explosives at the end. So it's you needed a play from your defense to or one more stand from your defense they couldn't do it you needed one more play from your offense they couldn't do it so it just felt like you know hopefully it's just because it was early in the season and you're breaking in new players on the defensive side of the football you're kind of going through a little bit of an injury thing up front on offense and maybe that's what it was but if there is maybe a concern or something you're going to look going forward is when you need that one play is it going to be like saturday where you come up short on that one play because Kansas State's going to be in at least four or five, maybe six more ball games where one play late in the game is what is needed. Yeah, I, I I think honestly, the defense, even though there were some areas that were not very good and 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 probably cost them early, like if the defense was just a little bit stronger early in the game, you know, who's to say that Missouri is even like actually in it? Um, but K State gave Missouri that opportunity early and they ran with it and they were able to, to grab the halftime lead and everything else. And it just, it comes down to that missed opportunity there with the, you know, K-State having the ball up 24, 20 and getting towards midfield. Um, you, you need to be able to score on that drive. Like that drive needed to end in a touchdown. It didn't. And uh, K-State kind of failed to convert on that. And, and that's, that's painful. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to a little bit of the coaching thing too, because you took a poor delay of game there that ultimately mm-hmm you could have had seven instead of three if, if that's not the case. So kind of a little bit of a coaching thing, or maybe that's a Will Howard thing. Um, you know, you, you, it's tough knowing who to ultimately put the blame on. Maybe it's 50-50 on that front. And look, I said this in my you know immediate story after the game, and, and I still feel this way to an extent, but I, I'm going to apply additional perspective that could be – a little bit of a devil's advocate to what my initial reaction was. I still think that the defense probably did enough, at least in the middle of that game, because they gave the offense multiple chances to go win and the offense didn't do it. And Kansas State this year is probably equipped, more equipped the way that they're assembled. Their experience and, um, and their veteran leadership, the majority of it is on the offensive side of the ball. So when you need a play, you'd like to think that your offense is the one that can do it. But I will say this, if you told me before the game that Kansas State scores 27 points and averages more yards per play against Missouri this year than they did last year, but gave up 30, I would have put it on the defense because you're giving up 30 to a not so great offense and you're scoring 27 on what I believe from what I saw Saturday and what we saw for the most part last year is a really salty Missouri defense. Yeah, the defense is pretty good for Missouri. And I, you know, we talked about it. You go out and you, you do these things, you should beat them. We talked about scoring 24, how that's important against Missouri. Uh, K State became just the second Power Five opponent that Drinkwitz has beat at Missouri that has scored 24 points, and Missouri has still found a way to win. So I guess in some respects, it is on the defense. Uh, but if you watch how that game played out, I think it just kind of goes to show how football works out in the end is that if K State goes up 31 to 20 on that drive, um, or maybe even multiple drives where they had a chance with the ball 24-20 to go down score. Drop. There's a chance that Missouri does not reach that 24 number because you know they're they're having to press a little bit more on how they're trying to get things done. Instead, you know they they could play it at their pace. They could kind of dictate the game. And I think too many times that's that's honestly what the problem was is that 
K-State had to play the game on Missouri's terms, whether it was K-State's offense on the field um, that, you know, trailed from basically the, the you know, la- latter part of the first quarter all the way through the start of the second or the second half. Uh, and then, you know, the, everything else defensively where Missouri was able to kind of go out there and still operate the way that they wanted to. They didn't have to stray too far from their game plan because they were never down more than seven points in the game. And that was, you know, at the very start of it. So uh, I think that's probably the the part that, that eats at you. But, you know, for K-State, you, you take what you can to get better from it. You try and wipe it. And honestly, uh, you just hope that some of the issues that are plaguing you have to do with the fact that you're either still missing some guys like on the offensive line in the case of Christian Duffy or that, you know, you have guys that are working themselves back defensively uh, that can help you. Like, you know, Kobe Savage is still coming off of injury, although I thought Saturday was his best game of the year. Um, I thought he had looked, you know, a little hobbled and, and not right the first two. I thought he was, you know, one, he was probably the only safety that played well on Saturday for K-State. Um, but, they, you know, been without Jake Clifton. Uh, that'll probably be another few weeks before before he gets out there. But uh, it'll be important to have him back for for depth at the linebacker spot. So I, I just think that there's a lot for K-State that you can look at. You can obviously overreact to it. And I think it, it's easier to overreact when it's a loss that stings as much as that one where K-State had every chance to win that game. And it also sucks to go lose to, to a foe that a lot of your fans associate with being a team that you should be able to beat and also – a regional rival that, that you want to be able to take down. So just an unfortunate day all around for the cats. And uh, now they try and move on and, and take on UCF. Yeah. The offense had multiple chances there in that third and fourth quarter to pull away, especially when they're up 24, 17, 24, 20 and didn't take advantage of it. It also feels like the, it was the offense that didn't get it done just because some of those drives were just halted by plain drops as well, or at least uh some miscommunication between the quarterback and and the uh, intended target when that was Ben Sennett a couple of times. And then you got to look. But then I keep saying it too, but it's like if the offense averages more yards per play this year than they did last year and you're scoring 27 points on Missouri and you get three touchdowns from Will Howard, you only turn it over once, you probably feel good about that. And defensively you say, I'm going to give up 30. I don't know if you feel great about that the way – because Missouri – Pride themselves on explosives during that game, and that they haven't been explosive ever uh, in the last couple of seasons. So, just it, it's hard to come up with the ultimate takeaway from that game. But what I will say is, is I'll probably have more questions about the defense going forward than the offense because the offense is not explosive. Um, turned the ball over, um, didn't really run the ball that great. But at the end of the day, they still considering the defense that they faced a pretty solid performance, even when they didn't have a lot going for them. Yeah. I, it's going to be, you know, just, man, it's a, it's a tough one to take in that loss. All right, let's, uh, let's do our final looks and thoughts on the game. We'll take a look back at our over unders for the week uh, and how they ultimately played out. Uh, probably not as fun for people when, uh, when there's, there's not a win, but uh, K-State catches by a running back. All three of us had the over. It was set at one and a half, uh, and that obviously uh, came to came to fruition. DJ Giddens had three himself. Treshawn Ward had five catches. Um, so eight of the 25 catches on Saturday came from K-State running backs. So that was a pretty easy one to hit. And it was clear that they knew that they needed to do that to try and get those guys involved and get them in a position to use their skills because it's been tough for K-State to get those guys to work very much uh, when it came to, you know, running behind the offensive line. And Treshawn Ward had a couple of moments. He had the one long play that set K-State up down at the nine-yard line. We, we talked about it. That The worst spot for K-State to be uh, when it's a goal-to-go situation is the nine because K-State's not been good in those situations this year. You can't run the ball very well right now. And uh, you've got a lot of room to go without being able to pick up a first down. And there's some, you know, conversation about that drive that ends up down there before K-State takes a bad delay of game penalty, um, should Treshawn Ward have slid? And I think you and I both said to each other when it happened, it's probably the smart play because I don't think he was going to go very much further and he was going to probably get it punched out from behind. So it was just best to go down and, and, and save the ball and save the possession. Yeah, I like that move by him. I think it was, the, you know, I get the old, the old guard wants a physical team that doesn't, 
shy away from contact, but the, you know, the more we, we watch football, the more we can see things kind of unfold before they really unfold. And that felt like it was going to be a fumble. So I didn't mind. it. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, we'll, we'll move on see, uh, what, what else we had on the docket. Phillip Brooks receiving yards, uh, over under 60 and a half for Phillip Brooks. Uh, it was, you know, fairly close. He had five grabs for 50 yards and a touchdown in the game, but he doesn't get to that number. Um, Philip Brooks, you know, after maybe game one and some some other questionable, you know, moments at times, he's been really good the last two games for K-State, and he's kind of been uh, what what you'd expect out of a guy that's been around that long. Uh, there's the experience and the reliability that comes with a guy like that. He's starting to prove it a little bit more. And then he was good in the return game on, on Saturday. And so, I mean, we made fun of him, but maybe Drinkwitz was right. Maybe uh, Philip Brooks is more integral to – K-State's offensive success than, than we actually thought, uh, but he doesn't reach the number, and we all had the under there. Yeah, he's been – he's their most consistent playmaker on the offensive side of the ball right now, I think, because, but you know, Ben Sane got taken away in game two. R.J. Garcia has disappeared since game one. Um, Jaden Jackson, I, I guess you can make an argument he's been pretty consistent as well, almost had his third touchdown on Saturday, but yeah. maybe in less volume than Phillip Brooks. But Brooks is the most dependable guy, and I think you kind of expected that. I don't think you expected him to be maybe the most prolific, and I think to an extent he has been, and they do need someone else to kind of take that um, duty, so to speak, uh, especially if a team can take away Ben Sinnott. Are you really worried about Kansas State right now? Probably not, but if you do that, then you probably are going to get bigger gains from Phillip Brooks moving forward until someone else proves that they can do it. Yeah. All right, the the next one, moving on, K-State total plays, 70 and a half. We all had the over. I think it worked out. I think 76 ended up being the number for the Wildcats on Saturday. So uh, K-State did run more than 70 and a half plays, and it was, al- it was almost enough to get the job done. The, the problem was just too many drives stalled out, um, and that's never a, a good thing for the Wildcats. Also, I mean, it, it showcases there that the defense was doing their job for – a very good chunk of the game because both teams were just giving the ball back and forth to each other without points being scored. Um, and, and so that's another highlight within that. But uh, K-State went over the 70 and a half plays mark. And you almost wonder too, if you know maybe it could have been more, maybe they could have played a little bit faster at times, like we've seen him earlier in the year, if Will Howard wasn't as hobbled as it certainly seems like he is right now. And that's something that tomorrow when we hear from Chris Kleiman, it's probably going to be pretty fascinating to hear uh, is for him to give an update on Will Howard. And then also, like, you know, it can be telling when when and if Will Howard shows up for media availability tomorrow. So uh, those are two big things to keep an eye out on. An update on Will Howard and an update on Daniel Green, who's not on the depth chart this week. Yeah, no, both of those uh, very important to, to kind of get a note on and see. All right, moving on. Uh, K- we had Jacob Parrish pass deflections, one and a half. Drew and I both took the o- under. You took the over. Uh, it was good line by Drew. Uh, he finished with one pass breakup. The Wildcats had four of them over the weekend. Uh, Will Lee had one of them. Brendan Mott had one of them. And then uh, the other one belonged to Marcus Siegel. So those were uh, the the pass deflections there. And it's tough to deflect the pass when Luther Burden and some of the Missouri receivers were just sneaking behind the defense and blown by you. Yeah, Parrish and Siegel were on the wrong end of a few of those for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, they probably had a lot more opportunities to get more PVUs. So probably a black eye on those two, but they only had one with how much they were in the action. Uh, and the two, though, one apiece by Will Lee and Brendan Mott, both really good plays. Yeah, yeah. Will Lee with the one uh, at the goal line, basically, that uh, forced Missouri to settle for a field goal. They didn't come away with a, a touchdown there, and that felt like a significant moment. That felt like the point in the game where, like, okay, this, this is this is K-State's window of opportunity, and they just didn't fully seize the moment. Uh, tackles for a loss, it was eight and a half. Another fantastic number. The final total for K-State ended up being eight. You were the only one that took the under there. Uh, and the way that I, I look at this, you know, really the story for the entire defense, and I think the pass rush kind of makes it go, especially with an inexperienced secondary right now, or at least one that is struggling to kind of find their full footing, is – the pass rush didn't show up until midway through the second quarter, maybe late second quarter. So and, when Brent hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it was, you know, it was good uh, for a stretch there. 
but it just it's taken through three games too long to get that going for K-State because even in games against inferior opponents like SEMO and Troy, early in the game, they did not seem to have that working for them, and then they finally got it moving in the right direction uh, later on, and, and you just got to start faster on defense for K-State, and I think that's probably one of the things that I'll be, I'll be looking for uh, when they face UCF this weekend. Yeah, eight, eight's a solid number, though. They shouldn't feel bad about yeah. that. That's actually, you know, if you ask me just blindly right now without telling me how many they had, I would have picked a, a lot less than eight. It didn't feel like that. Yeah. Uh, Mizzou only had four in the game on Saturday, uh, which I, I bet if you ask somebody, said, hey, it was eight to four tackles for loss. Who do you think had more? I bet a lot of people would say Missouri. But Yeah, I, I certainly would. And that also probably reinforces – my thought that the Kansas State offensive line, not as bad as people are, are making it out to be. Now, they still need to get better, um, and it's not good enough yet, but I thought Saturday against Missouri was actually a step in the right direction. I would agree with that. I, I mean, I think now part of that, uh, you know, real quick to dive into it, is probably the fact that K-State, for the most part, you know, I won't. I guess you can't say they abandon the run game, but – they really didn't give that many opportunities. I mean, running backs were under 20 carries for K-State over the weekend. And then you had some, you know, design runs for Will Howard and Avery Johnson that were in the mix there. But, you know, the, they really weren't running the ball a lot because they knew it wasn't going to work. And I think at times, it, you know, they, they still let some pressure through that was significant and important um, in the course of the game. But, yes, they they were better overall. It, was a, it truly was a step in the right direction. And, I, I mean – they they share the blame in what happened on Saturday, but they are not the the ones that you can point the finger at and say it was your fault that this loss happened. Where if K State had lost to like Troy or Semo in some realm, I think the way the offensive line played in those games, you would have been able to point the finger at them and say, "Hey, you're the reason for this." On Saturday, they they, they got better. They just faced a really good front from Missouri. Yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, I, I would just say that. Some of the pressure, excuse me, some of the pressures that did get through, probably more of a case of being outnumbered at the line of scrimmage than anything. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one other note to toss in here about the, the defense and the tackles for loss. Uh, Daniel Green had two and a half of them in the game. He led the team with nine tackles in there. So you mentioned him not being on the depth chart this week. That's a concerning thing for K State moving forward because. I, I mean, I said it early in the game. I, I was down on the field for the first half, and I sent a message to you guys, and I said, is it just me or does Daniel Green look bad and slow up there? And I think he did for the first you know, couple of drives of the game, but when he turned it on, he was very, very important for what K-State was trying to accomplish on Saturday, and I, I thought he actually ended up playing a pretty good game for the Wildcats despite spending some time in the medical tent. He's uh, much better against the run, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on with our over unders, Avery Johnson, total snaps, a half snap is what the, the line was. Uh, you know, I, I didn't anticipate it being such an important part of what K state needed to try and do offensively on Saturday. And, uh, you and drew both took the over wisely. Um, I just thought, you know, Hey, Chris Kleiman, not, not a guy that likes fun. We didn't get to see a ton of Adrian Martinez in the sugar bowl. when I thought that would happen. This may just be a standard Will Howard game, go out and do it for us, but they needed Avery Johnson. Now, the first snap that he got uh, as they were moving the ball down the field, that was like just legit. I think they planned on doing that. I think as the game wore on, you know, Chris Kleiman said after the game, no, it was kind of in the plan to do that. I think that they used Avery Johnson a few times more than what they anticipated because Will Howard just he, he couldn't move as well after he uh, whatever happened to him uh, in the second half of the game. One of my bold predictions, um, not that I would – I have a story every week at the end of the week. It's th three and out for three bold predictions for that particular game. Not that I think these things are going to happen, but three – toss three out that could happen that might be a little outlandish. One of mine was an Avery Johnson touchdown. Um, he was like a yard and a half away from that. So um, I felt a little vind vindicated on that front. Now, I, another one of mine was containing Luther Burden again. And that what that fell flat on its face, and and another one of mine was also, and I think it was headed in the right direction, was Brady Cook to be the leading rusher, and maybe if you take away the sacks, it might be close because none of the running backs really took off until Cody Schrader had to 
36 yard scamper in the fourth quarter, but obviously the sacks hurt Cook's yardage number and the fact that he was just like Will Howard, he's played on one leg by the end of the game. Yeah, uh, I think you're. I think you're probably right there, uh, Cook. Yeah, I mean, well, he he was running well early, and it was killing K State early on in the game. Uh, it took him a little bit to get it figured out. All right, that is uh, that is the the final thoughts on the Missouri game. It's out of the way, and now it's time to to focus on the the nine game stretch that matters most for the Wildcats. Big Twelve play gets underway this coming weekend. Cats and Knights, the first look at one of the four new members of the Big 12. UCF comes to Manhattan for a 7 o'clock kickoff on FS1. UCF has started their season 3-0. and They beat up on two really bad teams in Kent State and Villanova. And then they snuck out of Boise with a very, very tight win, 18-16 to on a big field goal as time expired. So this is a UCF team that isn't bad. I, you know, I think that they're in the best position of the current four new schools to compete instantly in the Big 12. They're just at a disadvantage because John Rice Plumley, their quarterback, is out and he will not be available for this game and a few more afterwards, likely. So UCF is bringing a backup quarterback to Manhattan. Uh, what are some of the, your storylines to watch for the Cats and the Knights this weekend, DY? Yeah, I've. I've with the backup quarterback, I think that'll be interesting. I, for Lucky for Kansas State, they did get one game of film on him because he played last week against Villanova. So in those cases, now, hey, UCF blew the doors off of Villanova. It was impressive even with the backup quarterback in the absence of John Rice Plumley. Usually the first game after you miss a, a significant contributor, whether it be quarterback, running back, whatever it may be, you play – everyone plays above their heads a little bit because they realize – that they have to compensate. And it's usually one of the better performances. And I think that's what you kind of saw last week from UCF. But the further you get removed from that, the closer you get back to reality where you start to lose that guy's presence because not everyone can sustain, you know, basically overperforming their expectations week in and week out. So does UCF come back down to earth a little bit? I think that is possible. Kansas State can really apply a pass rush too. That's often – problematic for a backup quarterback now in this case maybe not because you know fortunately for UCF it was smart of them to do so they went and got a veteran quarterback in the offseason to be the backup so he's not going to really be overwhelmed by the moment and being at Kansas State um, another angle to consider and it's certainly one that I hadn't thought of until actually it was on the three mile podcast earlier today and, and John Curtis and Coleman back both mentioned it I mean you know, Mizzou, we all knew Mizzou was going to circle that game on the on the Kansas State. You know, they wanted to beat them bad after getting blown out, got their doors blown off by the Wildcats a year ago and probably game planned all off season and schemed up all off season just to beat Kansas State. You saw the emotions afterwards. That meant a lot to them. Now, I don't think UCF is necessarily game planning for Kansas State the last eight months, but this game is going to mean a little bit extra for UCF. This is they want to leave their mark. They want to apply some juice. They want to make a statement because it is their first game in the Big 12. And what better way to do that than to go on the road and defeat the defending conference champion? So this is kind of what we said all year, all off season before before we even the game before the, the games were even played, is that Kansas State's going to be that game circled on a lot of calendars. We saw that was the case for Mizzou. I think it's going to be the case again for UCF. Yeah, I mean, that it, it's a good point because UCF is obviously coming into this all thinking that they have to prove it every time they go out there. I mean, it's the same type of deal. Um, a little di bit different because I, I don't think they're as good, but like OU goes to Cincinnati this weekend. Um, that's that's a significant thing to, to keep an eye on. So uh, all these – and BYU's in Lawrence against KU. Uh, Houston's the only one of the four schools that got to start at home – or I guess Cincinnati's doing it, uh, but they got to start at home with it. Um, but it's it, not e the easiest of opponents that were given to the four new schools to get things underway or circumstances with the road trip. I, I, I think that for UCF coming in, like the quarterback thing is a really, really big deal because Timmy McClain, he was not very good at USF uh, the, the last time that he played. Now, that was a, a long time ago. He, he's, he registered stats in 2021 and he was out last year and he's transferred to UCF. But – uh, the numbers weren't great, took a lot of sacks, 
threw more interceptions than touchdowns. Completion percentage was low, but he's been good this year for UCF. Now that again is in a game against a not very good team like Villanova. Uh, so we'll have to see where things stack up, but I guess I shouldn't say that like Villanova is a good FCS school. It's just, they're an FCS school, similar to what case State had to deal with, with SEMO. So I think that's part of it watching that situation. And I really think most of this comes down to though, like we said that the offensive line took a step forward on Saturday against Missouri. It's crucial then for them to take another step forward against UCF this weekend. Like you have to go out there and prove yourself a little bit more against UCF. And I also think uh, it's critical. Like I, I harped on it. I said it yesterday in the Sunday show, but the pass rush has to be firing instantly in the game. Don't, don't take time to settle in. If you can do that, you can force some more mistakes and get going because right now K-State has just two turnovers forced on the season. Only one of them in the heat of the battle. The other one was garbage time, whatever, but they forced the one interception that was Will Lee against Troy, and K-State needs to be better about that because that was one of the things that they were the best in the Big 12 at last year. They were second in interceptions. So, And, and a lot of that comes down to the pressure that they get, and they've been good at getting pressure they just have to get it earlier in the game. Like, hold the feet to the fire early. And then we'll uh, just have to keep an eye on, you know, Will Howard, how he plays and how he distributes it to his receivers. Because now not only are you waiting to see when and if Keegan Johnson is going to look like the receiver that was seemingly promised, uh, but also Will Howard is now banged up. So how is he going to be able to, to, to look on Saturday and – Honestly, this is just a game that's about surviving. Get back on track, start Big 12 play 1-0, and and with Will Howard being banged up and you know Jake Clifton being out and hoping to get him back at some point, Christian Duffy still looking to be at 100%, even though Chris Kleiman says that he'll play in some capacity on Saturday. Um, your bye week is right after this, and typically I think that a bye week four weeks into the season – probably sucks and is really stupid, doesn't do you much good. But for K-State, I think it's actually going to do them a lot of good at this point in time. And then you get back to playing the week after at Oklahoma State on a Friday night, and you hope you pick up momentum and run the rest of the season from there. Yeah, I mean, that's the way to look at it. No, defensively, you got to limit the explosive plays. I mean, they dominated Missouri on third down. Like, Kansas State was getting off the field when they would get get Missouri to third down. Mm-hmm. It was just the explosives on first and second that were problematic. So, yeah, at this point, if, if Kansas State gets back to limiting explosives from a defensive standpoint, I don't think they lose to UCF. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a game, given the circumstances of everything else, um, K-State should be in position to be able to handle UCF right now. They, It's just it, – it shouldn't be like the biggest – concern in the world for them but we'll we'll have to ultimately uh see how things end up going on and y- you look at you know how things have kind of uh gone like UCF has been they've been pretty pretty solid in, in some categories this year now again the competition level is is lesser I mean the the Boise State team that they needed a walk-off field goal to beat got torched by uh, albeit a really good Washington team in week one so It'll be uh, fascinating to watch. All right, let's roll on, get to uh, the the closing part of the show. Looking around the Big 12 from the weekend, and I think looking at these scores, it gives you good perspective on where K-State is at and how not to overreact to what happened and and what K-State can still do. Uh, We'll have our Big 12 power rankings later in the week. Uh, I know know you already sent me yours. I have not looked at them yet because I'm trying to, you know, integrity of the game, do mine before I see everybody else's. even though K State lost on on Saturday, they're still going to be they're they're still going to be a top three team in the Big Twelve to me uh, this week because you lose on a sixty one yarder on the road to to Missouri, who is a, a solid football team that has talent. Um, I don't think it makes you bad, and also there's nobody else in the Big Twelve right now that's screaming, "Come and take it!" Like uh, Kansas had an opportunity to probably move up more this week. All they had to go do was beat the crap out of a really bad Nevada team that two other teams had already done, and KU didn't do that. 31-24, it was a uh, kind of disappointing showing by them. Um, everybody else, you know, kind of struggled, and and honestly, BYU was probably the biggest mover and shaker this week with their win at Arkansas. So uh, what's your takeaway on the Big 12 right now, and, and who stood out with the best or worst performance of the weekend in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, the best performance of the weekend was BYU. I mean, winning on the road at Arkansas and doing so after 
you know, initially falling down 14 to nothing to begin the game. I thought that was pretty impressive to say the least. Um, Texas Tech rebounded. KU struggled against Nevada. And a little bit of a black eye there, but I, I didn't really change much of my power rankings, to be quite honest. I didn't mm-hmm. like there were some bad performances. Um, there was a few teams that dropped quite a bit, I guess, just because of that. But man, there were some really bad losses this week. I mean, Oklahoma State loses by three touchdowns to South Alabama. Iowa at State, uh, yeah, Iowa State loses at Ohio. Cincinnati loses to Miami, Ohio. Um, yeah, it's there are some bad losses in this league already, and it's not a great thing. Texas Tech has lost to Wyoming. Um, trying to think of some of the other ones here. So we allow we have a Wyoming loss, a Miami Ohio loss, a Texas State loss, a, a Rice Ohio, loss, Ohio Rice in South Alabama. Those are that's a lot of group of five losses, to put it frankly. But um, like you. I didn't move Kansas State a whole bunch, but I did drop them a bit. I think I had them at – maybe I had them at number two going into the week. I did drop them to number four. Um, obviously, Texas and Oklahoma would be the top two at this moment. Um, and one that people could probably quibble back and forth with. I have TCU number three right now mm-hmm. because that Colorado loss actually keeps looking better and better, um, even though the Buffaloes almost gave it up against Colorado yeah. State over the weekend um, and a not-so-flattering performance by them. But they also did it without Travis Hunter. I don't think that's the real Colorado team either. Um, as long as Chandler Morrissey is healthy, I think TCU is going to be a team that can give the Wildcats problems. There was a point where I was like, especially after week one, I was like, well, maybe UCF is the toughest home game on the Kansas State schedule. Like, there's still an argument for that, but I, I'm starting to like TCU a bit more than I than I thought I would because at one point I was like, man, this team's really fraudulent. Now I'm not so sure. Yeah, I you know I, I think the TCU offense. There should be no questions about that. Still, they've obviously been really good all season long. I think the question comes in with their defense. Uh, it seems like teams will probably be able to score on them, but you know they gave up forty five to start the year to a Colorado team that they probably didn't know at all like what it was going to look like, how it would work. And in the last two games, they've only given up nineteen points. Now, Houston, as we know, they've got some serious struggles going on, but. Uh, You're right. TCU probably much better than we thought after they had a a tough way to start the year. So uh, honestly, the biggest point is the Big 12 is very gettable. Nobody looks like a world beater because even Texas's win at Alabama looks lesser now. And they started off very, very, very slow at home against Wyoming. So basically, you look at Texas's resume. They beat an Alabama team that is nowhere close to what people would have expected because Nick Saban somehow either – got very unlucky with the quarterback room he, he brought in, or he was just woefully underprepared for losing Bryce Young. And then they have two games where they struggled against group of five opponents for a long time and didn't really put them away until late uh, when it was just, you know, you wore them down because you have far more athletes than they do uh, in Rice and Wyoming. Yeah, if I was Nick Saban, I'd probably just blame it on Bill O'Brien at this point because you, you have yeah. the ability to do so because I don't think he really helped the room out too much uh there so i think you know my biggest movers you know going back to your first point i did have some that moved a little bit now i have houston last i don't think that's a big departure from where i i had them last week but i've dropped oklahoma state all the way down to 13. um so that's a big mover down a big mover up for me actually west virginia have them at night they're not bad right now yeah they you know they've they found ways to to win uh against against pitt uh, who ate a lot of you know what? I guess uh, based off the the sounds from that game, the so, Big Twelve punching bag pit. The Big Twelve. Yeah, uh, that's uh, pit. Uh, that yet yeah, it cannot feel good right now. Losses what, what to they, Cincinnati and West Virginia in back to back weeks. Oh yeah, what do they say? Eat shit, pit. I think they, they do they, say that. They, I, they, I saw the video uh, of them doing it in the middle of Sweet Caroline this weekend yeah. uh, in Morgantown. So. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, not a good showing for for Pitt. And uh, really, they, they've they been the thing to help kind of prop up the Big 12, some wins against the ACC for uh, for the league. Yeah, and, and you have to wonder what happens going forward because I think West Virginia lost their starting quarterback in that game, Garrett yeah. Green. Yep, uh, I know. I saw something earlier today about Garrett Green uh, not practicing currently, and we'll, I guess, have to see how that works out. You know, Garrett Green, I I don't know that he's, you know, the, the greatest – um, but he's certainly gives some fire and, and has worked pretty hard 
uh, for West mm-hmm. Virginia. But yeah, uh, earlier today, I guess Neil Brown said that uh, he won't play unless he can move around and use his best skill set, which is his athleticism. So he's got an ankle injury he's dealing yeah. with. So yeah, and Garrett Green that can't move. I agree with Neil Brown. Maybe that doesn't really help you a ton because that's one thing he can do. He's a good runner. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, absolutely. Uh, this weekend in the Big 12, uh, we know K-State and UCF. I mentioned Cincinnati, Oklahoma, not all that interesting. TCU going to you know go and uh, win the iron skillet against SMU. Uh, but mm-hmm. some real intriguing games because Texas Tech is going to Morgantown. So kind of significant if Garrett Green can't go because – this is, a, this is a West Virginia team with momentum right now that if you get Texas Tech, who's already got a road loss and another loss that, that kind of, I think, hurt them you know, with the, the morale, um, this would have been a game that maybe West Virginia could have been sneaky on. But if you don't have Garrett Green, I, I'm not sure that I like Nico, Nico Maggioli or whatever his name is that started the game in Stillwater last year. Um, so that'll be fascinating to watch uh, Texas Tech, West Virginia. Yeah, I, I can see it being close, but I'm not sure the Mountaineers move without their QB. Yeah, uh, I think, honestly, the game of the week in the Big 12, it's it's pretty easy to see. It's BYU at KU. Two teams that are 3-0, middle of the afternoon kick on ESPN. Uh, that's going to be a fascinating watch. And whoever wins that game is going to have some some serious juice after the first third of the season is put away because I wouldn't have picked – well, KU, I could have seen it. I mean, once they got past Illinois like they did, I think I just gave 4-0 and to them. But BYU is better than anticipated, and they're playing well. And even though I think Kalani Sataki does a lot of, you know, gamblish things and can be stupid at times, I think he's a, a really good coach, and I think he's awesome at BYU. That's going to be a, just a fantastic game to keep an eye on. No, that's that's got interesting written all over it. I think – I think Kansas is the better team, but man, BYU's juices are going to be flowing too. Uh, and then the worst or slash best game of the week, depending on what you are looking for, uh, the toilet bowl of the Big 12. It gets underway early this year. Oklahoma State at Iowa State. I I can tell you this much. Those two teams are probably the two lowest on my power rankings this coming week. Uh, uh, Houston. That, yeah, I mean, Houston's bad, but... I don't know. I just <laughs> – Iowa State, that thing, they cannot score right now. That game is in Ames. The over-under is 37.5, and, and the Cyclones are three-and-a-half-point favorites. I, you, you got anything you like here, D.Y.? I, I mean, I think Iowa State can win because they are the home team. And, yeah, their offense is putrid, but usually your weakest link – does play better at home, right? That's that's how yeah. I always talk about it. And Iowa State's defense, and, and your weakest league also plays worse on the road, right? It plays better at home, mm-hmm. but worse on the road. Oklahoma State still doesn't have a quarterback either. Like, I like, I don't know if Oklahoma State will be able to score in Ames. Now, if Oklahoma State was at home, maybe I like it better for them. But like Iowa State can win this by the same score they lost by last week. Very true. Very true. Uh, I did this on uh, Saturday or on Sunday with uh, Drew and Fan when we talked about the Oklahoma State quarterback situation, and maybe you know because you've seen. Uh, Do you want to take a guess of which of the three quarterbacks had the highest QBR for Oklahoma State on Saturday? Well, I don't think Rangel played enough to really probably get much of it, and and Bowman was so bad to begin. I'll say Gundy. It was Gunner Gundy, 21.6. Uh, <laughs> Alan Bowman got a 2.3, and Garrett Rangel got a 3.1. I didn't even know single digits was a thing for uh, the QBR. But I, I just – I actually, I think I – I don't know if I watched the game. I think it was listening to it on the way back or something. Um, yeah, that's what it was. But, man, at the in a stat line and the audio of the Alan Bowman performance <laughs> – and hearing it from Robert Allen as well, it just that didn't sound good. Yeah, yeah. the pistols were not firing on Saturday. Uh, Oklahoma State averaged 3.3 yards per, per pass. They averaged 3.2 yards per run. Uh, so that is not an offense that is humming at this point in time and uh, might be the right kind of opponent for K-State coming off of a bye week, too, to do some really nasty things to in Stillwater. 
Yeah, but I'll say this, and I know it sounds crazy. That game still scares me because it's in Stillwater. Yeah, I know that that place is that place has uh has done some numbers to you. I mean, what uh, since you've nice. yeah yeah I was gonna say since you've covered K State, you you got you got the great introduction to it seventeen, and then yeah. everything since then has been just kind of weird and disappointing. I mean, nineteen they they came in ranked. They had just beaten Mississippi State on the road. It was a big deal. And weather delays, weird game. They just never were really in it. 21, uh, Skyler was hurt. Will Howard was banged up. And Jaron Lewis was finishing the game at quarterback. That was terrible. Also, I think weather delays for that one. Uh, so hopefully the weather stays away for 2023 uh, when we end up in Stillwater, you know, two two weeks from now. Was 2020 the, the the game where Will Howard fumbled it? Was that in Manhattan? Yeah, yeah, that was the one in Manhattan where uh, Will Howard, he f- had a f- bad fumble. He had a bad interception. Uh, that was a peak, like, early career Will Howard game there. That so. was a 20-18 to 18 final, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. K-State had every chance to win that game. And it's incredible how bad 2020 can be remembered. K-State was in, like, every single game they played, except for That's basically the Texas game. At, in Iowa, Iowa State. State. Yeah. Those were like the only two. <laughs> yeah. Iowa State was 45 to zero. That yeah, year. That was cool. bad. Uh, yeah. That was. Uh, they beat Oklahoma that year still. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> what a, what a time. All right. That will do it for us. We will be back on Wednesday to recap everything that Chris Kleiman had to say. We obviously expect some big injury updates from him uh, on Tuesday as well as just the the total outlook for UCF, who comes in for the conference opener in Manhattan. Everybody rejoice and and thank whoever you pray to at night because K-State is opening Big 12 play at home. I know the the conference hates K-State, but they are finally letting the Wildcats open Big 12 play at home. Hallelujah. We'll see you next time on K-State Online.